Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Grant Jones. Uh, I have been in the job for six weeks, so please be gentle. Um, hopefully I'll last a bit longer than Bonza, which we're going to discuss <laughs> today. Uh, these are um, di interesting times, as the Chinese proverb goes. Um, we've had a very busy um, month, I suppose, with um, turbulence in the airline industry, pun intended, uh, bonds are collapsing. Um, how do we cope with all these changes? Um, these guys um, work within airports, so uh, they know and understand how we get airlines into Australia, what happens when one disappears out of Australia or out of a regional um, uh, airport. Uh, so we just want to discuss the pressing issues. Um, first of all, I suppose, is from Christina. How do we get people flying into Australia when there are issues at hand that we need to recognise? Putting me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> so first, in order to get um, people to fly here, we need to get airlines here. And, uh, and that's practically my job. So a lot of people are generally surprised that airports don't just sit around and wait for airlines to come in and then go, oh, do we have space for you? Are we going to charge you? Um, we actually, all major airports globally have teams like my team at Sydney Airport that chase the world, chase airlines, travel around the world, um, spend a lot of time at speed dating conferences um, for aviation and then present business cases um, specifically to airlines for which could potentially serve routes that we consider critically underserved, unserved, or um, potential opportunities because we see that the average airfares are way too high or the existing flights are operating at capacity. So it's basically getting new airlines, um, going out there, speaking to airlines that don't fly to Australia or to Sydney yet, and then we, of course, also work really closely with our existing airlines on bigger planes, more flights, more destinations. But it's not as simple as saying, OK, you're, you're welcome into the country, here's a couple of slots, is it? It's a lot more complicated than No, that. a lot of people think that it's enough if we just wave a few slides and have the Opera House on it, which can be helpful. But it's actually, it's quite boring, really. It's very data-driven, very analytical. Um, that's the whole back office. So the airlines are really sophisticated with their network planning and how they go about their decisions and scheduling. But there's certain data that they can't get. And also, if you think about an Emirates sitting in Dubai in head office, they've got the whole world to choose from. So if they've got new aircraft coming into their fleet, they can send those planes anywhere in the world. And there's only so much time a team can spend on working out where the strongest business case is. So that's why we are out there and we are making sure that Australia and specifically Sydney in my case is front of mind for them. But it's not just about them, you know, uh, and their passengers wanting to see the Opera House or the Harbour Bridge. I mean, they have to be able to service those aircraft, they have to be able to turn them around, they have to be able to send them back full because otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a cost. So how do you encourage them or how do you inform them as to how that works? Generally speaking, every airline, in order to operate a flight, an international flight specifically, profitably, you need three main passenger segments. So you need leisure demand, you need business demand, you need what we call um, visiting friends and relatives, and then of course you also need to fill the belly of the aircraft. And all of that you need to fill in both ways. So it's not just enough to go out and say, hey, We've got really strong inbound visitation demand from your destination X to Sydney, but we really need to work with the airlines and make sure that we drive the rest of the demand. And that's where Sydney really has um, a very compelling business case because we do have one of the most um, uh, travel-loving populations with um, highest trips per capita. So outbound leisure demand is there. We've got a huge and growing population that was um, born overseas, which stimulated a lot of travel coming in and going out. And um, we also do um, have a lot of cargo demand as well. So my team is basically structured. On the one hand, we spend a lot of time chasing those flights, getting those flights in. And um, up until a few years ago, that was literally all we did. And um, that process can take a really long time. There's a lot of risk involved for airlines to launch a new route, a lot of unknowns. And it used to take, sometimes it can take years, where you're building relationships, you're working, you're building the business case, you're building the trust that the route's going to work. And then 
the route finally happens and we have a big party for the first flight and then we basically said, okay, good luck now. Yeah, you're, now you're on your own and make the most of it. And I changed that, so I built um, a new function within our space, which we call basically aviation marketing. And all our team does is not traditional classic marketing, um, promoting the asset of Sydney Airport, but they basically wear the hats of all the different airlines, work really closely with our tourist boards, Tourism Australia, Destination New South Wales, overseas tourist boards to really support those airlines and making sure those flights are full and they're operating profitable. Um, but once they get, do get into Australia, I suppose people want to see the rest of Australia. And this is where we come to the regional airline um, proposition uh, and Bonza. Um, it, it came into the market, you know, it, was, uh, it got everyone to cut their prices flying into regions and so on, but then obviously it wasn't able to survive and then we saw prices go up, go, uh, up again. Uh, James, how does someone get all those internationals here in the first place out towards those regional destinations? Yeah, thanks, Grant. It's great to be able to speak about this. And, the, and a bit that um, Christina didn't talk about is the politics that goes with this. I think You're people will probably remember that. the Qatar Airways um, discussions um, uh, last year. And so there's all the data, there's all the research, there's all of those um, um, form formalities that need to go, but there's also politics involved as, as well, and interested parties with their with their um, with their lobbyists and, and lobbying politicians and so on. And so I think that's very important that the the tourism uh, segment has an interest in this as well. That most of those jobs that are created are beyond the airport. So airports um, employ probably about 11,000 people across the country. But 700,000 people uh, are employed because of airports in the tourism uh, and, um, and freight uh, and supply chain uh, areas. So it's very important that we do um, have a voice to make sure that we are strongly putting our case there, that we do want more competition, we do want more airlines flying to Australia. And we've got a battle. Um, the work that Christina and her team do and, and the other uh, gateway airports we lost half the number of airlines flying to Australia during COVID. We have to get them back, and we're getting them back, but we also have to bring back the capacity as well. So it's not just getting the airline, it's how many flights are they doing? What sort of aircraft are they, are they operating to get more capacity back? And that will improve that consumer confidence. But once people here, as, as Grant says, they want, to, they want to see the whole of Australia. So they want to do the, the Great Barrier Reef, they want to go to Uluru, they want to do the, the vineyards and, and the wineries of South Australia and Western Australia. We know that in the good times, probably 30% of all the people on a domestic flight are international tourists. So we need to encourage more international tourists to then go out and explore the regions. Lots of international tourists coming to Australia are coming here for a nature holiday. And one of the challenges that we have is to make sure that aviation is as sustainable uh, and as environmentally friendly as possible. It's a very difficult sector to fully abate those carbon emissions. And that irony that people coming for a nature holiday uh, are flying a long way uh, in an aircraft. So we need, to, we need to work on improving the sustainability there. But how do we, how do we keep the, um, the competition in the, in the domestic market? Well, uh, you know, a fun fact is that two companies control 95% of all the flights. And that's one of the challenges that we have here. That's more, you think Coles and Woolworths getting a lot of attention at the moment. Combined, they only control 65% of the supermarkets in Australia. So Qantas Group and Virgin controlling such and being such dominant players, we need to do something to perhaps break that. So how do you pose that very difficult question to the political entities that make those decisions? Um, Christine, first, how do, you, how do you have that discussion with upper levels of government? How do you say, you know, we need to spread the load a bit more? We actually have um, really proactive and good relationship and, and a range of these topics and discussions with government. A um, good example for that is, um, obviously, as James um, hinted at earlier, is bilateral air services. So the um, Department of Infrastructure that negotiates for these services on behalf of the government has, um, uh, is very transparent around their forward negotiating program and does request um, so, uh, stakeholders to put in submissions in terms of, so we have the opportunity to put in what markets we'd like them to 
focus on um, where we see um, a lack of demand, and that often is goes a long way out because if you need to get the framework in place, that can take a long time. So we need to make sure that we're on top of it. Another um, very positive uh, bit of news that Sydney Airport had earlier this year was that for the first time in 27 years, the federal government announced a reform of the Demand Management Act of Sydney Airport, which um, most importantly provides a lot more transparency around slots are allocated. And um, it also um, is a big win for efficiency and for the passenger experience because it allows Sydney Airport to, um, in the case of a bad weather event, to make up for um, flight delays um, within a few hours. So that means that a lot less passengers are going to get stranded. So that's just a few examples of um, areas where we're working really closely with the government. But do you think, James, that we're underutilising the slots, that we're not taking advantage of the opportunities or possibilities to increase, you know, that competition? Well, we do need more capacity and we need to use the capacity that we've got better and smarter. And the, the changes that Christine is talking about are, are once in a 27-year change. You think going back 27 years ago when um, some bureaucrats decided how many aircraft are allowed to take off and land in Sydney and then no one has changed that since then. So we need to be more dynamic, more flexible about that. Um, people, um, I believe, people want to be able to get home, people want to be able to get to their destinations um, as much as possible. There's probably been a lot of talk recently about consumer compensation schemes and, and we can understand the, the reason for that. But let's look at some of these fundamentals that will actually help people um, get, get home or get to where they want to go um, much um, quicker, easier than simp and simpler than perhaps being um, bogged down in, um, in some um, legal um, authority to try and get uh, a few hundred dollars um, back months after that, that delay uh, occurred. So um, we really need to push and progress uh, a new runway in Melbourne. And uh, that's been planned for almost 50 years now, but um, the, there are still holdups um, on that. Um, that, that no, that, that department or another department just needs another bit of new information or some new data and new research. And we also look at Perth. So Perth also has a, a demand management system, a slot management system, but it's not regulated like it is in, in Sydney. So, um, so um, airports want the capacity. Airports want to do this because what that does is it drives competition. If you've, got active, if you've got more slots, you can get more carriers, whether they're international or domestic. The people who don't want those new runways or the changes to the slot management systems are the people who already hold and control those slots. And talking about flexing uh, their muscles too, um, I mean, is, say, a Cebu Airlines as important as Emirates and Singapore, Christina, when you're talking about, you know, um, giving them an opportunity to fly into Australia? Oh, absolutely. Um, Cebu is actually a really good example that you're bringing up there. Um, they are um, they operate an A330, and they have the highest seat density on an A380 globally. So they squeeze 417 passengers on board their plane, which from an airport perspective is actually really great utilization of one of our slots. So, um, but in general, it's very often, especially in my space and my team space, it's very often those smaller airlines that um, need our support the most. So if I use um, Emirates, obviously very sophisticated in what they're doing um, through the joint venture with Qantas, very powerful position here in the Australian market. If I look at a Sri Lankan Airlines where I've spent probably eight years of my life trying to get them to um, finally launch their services to Sydney, um, they're coming in with a much smaller team, um, much smaller resources in head office. And um, that's where we then come in on the aviation marketing side where we see hey, Sri Lanka as a destination is just really not getting the attention that it should be getting in the Australian outbound market. Um, so why don't we help them in that space? So well, given absolutely. that opportunity, Fiji Airways uh, today has been announced as the 15th to join One World. So give them the scope and then they can succeed. Yep. Um, so going back to competition, and this is the elephant in the room, uh, mm -hmm. Western Sydney Airport, how's that going to play into things, James, do you think? Well, it will be a game changer, and, um, but what we don't know yet is who's going to be flying there, what sort of, um, what sort of um, passenger numbers, what sort of freight volumes and those sorts of things. Um, it's uh, um, it's a uh, uh, reminder that it should be on airplane mode, please. Uh, airplane mode. Airplane mode. 
Um, what, what Western Sydney Airport do is, I mean, it will start small, but there is, um, there is uh, a growth trajectory there. Uh, they're still on target to, uh, to operate by the end of 2026, and they are predicting that within the first sort of 18 months, two years, that they would be operating at, at volumes of around Adelaide Airport uh, size. Um, we've seen in the past couple of months a real shift in thinking with Western Sydney Airport that the executives, the board, the, 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 the strategy, the business plan was a construction site. They needed to just build, build the runway, build the terminal. What we've seen in the past few, few months is they are now suddenly um, looking and thinking like an airport. So they are also um, having these discussions with international carriers and with the domestic carriers and so on um, to work out those, those long-term operating arrangements. So I think it will be, I mean, it will be a game changer and it will change um, um, people's perspective and some other options, but at the moment it's too early to tell um, what that's going to do to the other airports um, in Australia. But build it and they will not necessarily come. I mean, how do you stay ahead of those changes, Christina? How do you... Uh, offer Sydney Airport as the best alternative to fly into? Well, I guess um, it's kind of, that's the kind of stuff I dream about, um, building an airport from scratch without having to deal with um, pre-existing infrastructure and the challenges of um, upgrading that. Um, I've had that in a previous life, so I came to work for Sydney Airport, um, working for, having worked for Munich Airport previously. So that is also, I, um, I sometimes find the attention that, ooh, the fact that we've got a competitor now um, gets, especially in the media, quite amusing because I come from an aviation background in Europe where it's totally normal that you have multiple um, airports within an hour driving distance. So I know nothing else and all I've seen is absolutely positive from that because it's gonna really force us to focus on our game and um, deliver and um, make sure that we are the better choice for, for passengers in the Sydney um, catchment area. And the one thing I'd add to that as well is also when you look at the other um, major Australian airports, they all have really active aviation development teams. They're really aggressive. They're always out there, always get, you know, um, my CEO always hears about, oh, Melbourne Airport, I hear they're out there and marketing there and there. It, they're, they're amazing. They're really good. Um, know the teams really well. What's really important is, and what not a lot of people are aware of, we compete globally. There's so many issues around um, capacity globally since coming out of COVID. The supply chain issues that still haven't been fixed mean there's so much less aviation capacity out there and so much more global competition. So going back to my Emirates example, if they have a new A380 joining in their fleet, they can send that to New York, they can send that to Paris, they can send it to Melbourne, or they can send it to Sydney. And by the way, we are a bloody long way away from everywhere. And um, you can use that A380 and operate a daily flight into, your, um, into London, Paris on your six hour flight, or you need two and a half A380s to do the same into Australia, and you need twice the crew, you need to carry heaps of fuel, so it is bloody competitive. And uh, I know we're a great destination, Australia is amazing, but we're also a really long way away. So next time you go to Sydney Airport, think about what Christine does the back end, <laughs> uh, and think about the politics that change has to deal with at the, at the front end, the pointy end of um, airlines. So thank you very much both for your time today. I think it was a, a fantastic insight. So a round of applause. Thank you.